Imaginary Fred by Owen Colfer. Headaches are a pain. A bee sting hurts even more. But there is one thing that's worse than getting stung on the head by a bee on a rainy day, and that is loneliness. Being alone is no fun. The first five minutes are okay, but it's downhill from there. And if you're alone, you're alone. It's not as if you can wish a friend to life. Usually this is true. You can wish and wish until your hair stands on end, but no imaginary friend will appear. Unless... The conditions are just right. And if you add a little electricity, or luck, or even magic, then an imaginary friend might appear just when you need one. An imaginary friend like Fred. Fred floated like a feather in the wind until a lonely child wished for him. Fred was always happy to be summoned, and he tried really hard to be the best imaginary friend he could be. He dressed up, dressed down, played ball, became a ball, and did whatever else his real friend wanted to do without once complaining. But no matter how hard Fred tried, the same thing happened every time. One day, his friend would find a real friend in the real world. A friend who did not have to be ignored when grown-ups were around. When this day came, as it always did, Fred would feel himself fade. Usually, by lunchtime on the second day, Fred would be mostly invisible. And by bedtime on the fourth day, there would barely be a scrap of Fred left, just enough for the wind to catch and whisk him into the sky, where Fred would stay until someone new wished for him. Fred was glad that his friends found other real friends to play with, but sometimes he wished he had a friend who would need him forever. He dreamed of a friend who liked reading, music, and drama like he did. He imagined them sitting together, reading adventure stories, and looking for shapes in the clouds. This was Fred's dream. And one day, a lonely boy called Sam wished hard for a friend when the conditions were perfect. Fred appeared and soon realized that Sam was the friend he had been dreaming of. Fred had never had so much fun. Sam loved to read, just like Fred, and was most upset if he didn't get through at least one book per day. When they weren't reading, Sam and Fred would try to understand how the toilet worked. They'd listen to music on Sam's dad's sound system, which had 13 speakers. Or they would write plays and act them out for Sam's parents. But even though every morning brought new delights, Fred couldn't help thinking that every evening brought them closer to the day when Sam wouldn't need him anymore. And that would be the saddest day of his imaginary life. So Fred decided that he would enjoy every single moment with Sam until that time came. The two friends pretended to be French and studied mime. They made Japanese masks, practiced their classical instruments, and planned their own comic book. They called themselves the Dramatic Duo. But one day, Sam came home late from a party, and Fred felt a nervous flutter in his imaginary tummy. Was this the beginning of the end? Was he headed back into the sky? Fred checked his arm and thought that maybe he had faded a little already. When Sam came home, he had an excited look in his eyes, a look Fred had seen before. I made a new friend, Sam told him. She's a girl called Sammy, which is funny because I'm called Sam. She loves to read and has written and illustrated her own comic book series. You're going to love her, Fred. Fred thought that he probably would love Sammy, 
if he were able to stay around long enough to meet her. But don't worry, Sam said. Just because I met Sammy doesn't mean I don't need you. You're still my main man. In Fred's experience, there was only room in a heart for one best friend. I will always be your friend, Fred said. Just promise that you won't forget me. I promise, said Sam, and he meant it. The next morning, Sam was gone when Fred woke up, and there was a note on his pillow. I am meeting Sammy to brainstorm our comic book. Back later, your pal, Sam. Comic book, thought Fred. That was our idea. Me and Sam. Fred checked his arm again, definitely fading this time. When Sam came home several hours later, Fred called an emergency meeting of the dramatic duo. Okay, Sam, he said. I want to prepare you for what's coming. In a day or two, I will disappear. It's not your fault. It's just that now you have a real friend. You don't need me anymore. The best thing you can do is let me go without making a scene. Sam did make a scene. He swore he would never let Fred go. But the next day, Sam left the house early again to meet with Sammy, and Fred was left behind. I can see through my hand now, thought Fred. When Sam returned home later that day, he brought Sammy with him. Sammy wore round glasses that made her eyes seem huge. She pulled a cello case behind her on a cart and carried an art bag so she could work on her comic book whenever an idea struck. Sam introduced them. Sammy, meet Fred. Fred, meet Sammy. This is a waste of time, thought Fred. Only people with an imaginary friend can see an imaginary friend. But Sammy stuck her hand out in exactly the right direction and said, Pleased to meet you, Fred. Fred was surprised. He had never been visible to two people before. He shook Sammy's hand. I know you're worried I don't need you anymore, said Sam, but you're wrong. I need you more than ever. Why? asked Fred. Why do you need me now? You've got Sammy. Two reasons, said Sam. First, I never want to let you go. Fred thought he would cry, and that was only reason number one. And reason number two? he asked. Tell him, said Sammy, elbowing Sam the way friends do. Okay, said Sam. Reason number two is that we need you to be in our quartet. Fred was confused. Quartet means four, he said. There are only three of us. Aha, said Sam, like a great detective. That's where you're wrong. Yes, said Sammy, clapping her hands. You're wrong, because there are four of us. Sammy stepped to one side, and Fred saw a small girl with a violin case, and a smile that made him want to smile too. This is Frida, said Sammy. Hi, Fred, said Frida, waving her hand. Sam's told us all about you. I hope we can be friends. Sammy has an imaginary friend, Fred realized, and he waved back as he noticed that his hand seemed absolutely solid, not see-through at all. Frida set her violin case on the floor and opened it. We need to practice, she said, or we'll never get to Carnegie Hall. Sammy rolled her eyes. Frida is so strict, she said to Fred, but you'll get used to it in a couple of years. Fred did get used to it. He quite enjoyed being told what to do by Frida with her dazzling smile. The four friends spent all their spare time together, having violin battles, reading comic books, practicing plumbing, pretending to be French, and arguing over what they would call their quartet. They eventually settled on the Quarreling Quartet, which they all agreed was the perfect name. 
the quartet made their debut at the school Christmas concert, much to the confusion of the audience. But then, something interesting happened. The older they grew, the less time the four friends spent together. Sam and Sammy, it seemed, preferred graphic novels to music, and they left the quartet to concentrate on their comic book series. Carnegie Hall was eventually played. Not as a quartet, however, but as a duo. Again, much to the confusion of the audience. And this, dear friends, is the interesting thing that happened. Even though they didn't see their human friends much anymore, Fred and Frida did not begin to fade, nor get swept back up into the sky like they had so many times before. Instead, they stuck around being imaginary friends to each other. They became quite famous in the imaginary community, and a statue is commissioned to be erected in the sky above their imaginary house. As this was the first case of its kind, imaginary scientists spent years trying to figure out how it had happened. Eventually, they concluded that friendship is friendship. Imaginary or not, the same laws apply. The statue should have disappeared every time a gust of wind came along, but it never did. Fred was one of the world's best imaginary friends. There was just one problem. He kept disappearing. Fred wanted a friendship that would last forever, and that's exactly what he got when he met Frida. Now, you could wait for your imaginary friend to come when the conditions are just right, or we could draw our own. I wish I had an imaginary friend here at the library. I know. I'll draw one. Start with a sheet of untreated paper, like construction paper or watercolor paper. We'll paint on this paper using invisible ink, also known as lemon juice. Squeeze the lemon juice into a little dish and grab a Q-tip or a paintbrush. Dip it in the lemon juice and you're ready to paint with invisible ink. Make a wish and then draw your imaginary friend. You should be able to see what you're doing as long as the lemon juice is wet on the paper. But it does dry pretty quickly, and once it does, it's completely invisible. When you paint with this kind of invisible ink, the more you put on a line, the stronger that line will appear. So keep dipping your Q-tip or paintbrush into the lemon juice and don't let it get dry. What does your imaginary friend look like? Give them a name. Give them a hobby. What do they like to do? Do they like to play guitar? Maybe they like gardening. Fill in the scenery. Maybe draw them a little house to live in. Imagine a story for your imaginary friend. Do they go on adventures? Do they play games? What do they enjoy? What would you like to do with your imaginary friend? Mine is finished. Meet my imaginary friend, Lucinda. What's that? You don't see her? That's okay, you will. Let's wait for her to dry. There are more things to do with invisible ink, like write a secret message. Remember not to let your Q-tip or paintbrush get too dry when you make the letters. This is a fun way to send a hidden message to a friend, real or imaginary. If you want to be extra sneaky, you could write something boring right on top of your secret hidden message. Mine says, this is most certainly a very plain and uninteresting piece of blank paper. You can reveal your hidden message any time after the invisible ink is dry. To do this, we'll heat up the paper. You can hold it in front of a hot lamp, use a hair dryer, or with a grown-up's help, use an iron. Put your iron on its lowest settings, either synthetic or silk, 
and make sure that the steam function is off. Make sure you iron with a grown-up's help over an ironing board or a heat-proof towel. Move the iron slowly all around the paper. Don't let it sit in any one spot for too long or your paper will burn. After about a minute, you should see your hidden invisible ink start to appear. It'll be light at first, but the more you keep ironing, the darker it will get. Don't adjust your heat past the silk or synthetic setting on the iron. If your invisible ink isn't working, it's likely because you're using the wrong type of paper. Regular printer paper won't work for this because it's treated with chemicals that make it resistant to acid and heat. So be sure you're using untreated paper, like most construction papers or watercolor paper. On untreated paper, acid and heat can work together to reveal the message. When you apply the lemon juice to untreated paper, it soaks into the paper's fibers, breaking down some of the cellulose. Cellulose comes from the wood the paper is made of. It is long chains of sugars linked together. When you apply an acid, like lemon juice, to the paper, it starts a slow chemical reaction, which breaks down the cellulose into other compounds that oxidize, or turn brown, when exposed to the air over a long period of time. This is the same process that turns apples brown when they sit on your counter for too long. If you gave it enough time, the acid in the paper would reveal the hidden message all on its own, with no heat applied. That's why some older books turn yellow. They have acid in the paper. The heat just speeds up this natural reaction. But the heat works in a second way, too. Not only does it oxidize the broken down cellulose in the paper, but it also oxidizes the lemon juice itself. Lemon juice contains its own sugar structures independent of the paper, so when heat is applied, it will turn brown, like caramelization. Both of these chemical processes make lemon juice an excellent form of invisible ink for revealing hidden messages or creating imaginary friends. For more information about receiving STEAM kits, visit the Kids and Families page at coosbaylibrary.org.